the simultaneity or issue of the so when we discuss to remember the, the, the relative positions position of two light spots on the screen and there was these questions of are they can we really consider them simultaneous in particular the, in the bottom line the, the question is because we define the separation vector this psi a so the stream projection of the separation vector from the separation vector which is something defined on iso lambda iso affine parameter uh, surfaces um, can we really consider this as uh, as the separation between two light spots received by an observer at the same time so that's the that's the idea and actually the <coughs> the answer is you cannot really say that but the result is the same that's quite well so let me just show you there just one a small calculation that can uh, that explains that so the idea is that we are considering um, so the light cone, fast light cone of uh, a given observer. We don't, that doesn't really matter. But we the, the two light beam, the two light rays within the light beam that we are considering are belonging to this uh, to this null cone. And if we are so, we have basically two ways of slicing. This light cone. The first one is what we have done before, the uh, the iso lambda slicing. So that would correspond to something like this. Say for example. So this would be a lambda equal constant slicing of the light cone, and this is how we define the xi. So xi was something connecting the two rays along those. Uh, the, well, this slicing. But then you can also consider a given another observer receiving this light beam with a given four velocity, like this. So we need another color, it's a bit uh, easy here. But. And this observer could define as another slicing of this of this light cone corresponding to his or hers uh, simultaneity hypersurface. So in this case we have another slicing. Or something like this, maybe. Wow. And the question is if I define now a, another separation vector that I will call, for example, zeta, zeta mu, like this, along this tau equal constant hypersurface, do I get on the screen, in terms of the screen projection, the same thing for zeta and for xi. If I get the same thing, that means that it doesn't really matter how I defined it from the beginning. Um, this, the screen projection of projection of the xi mu, if it corresponds to the screen projection of the zeta mu, then physically speaking, I don't care that I started from something which is not simultaneous. Right. So um, you remember that the xi, xi mu was defined as the difference of two in, well, between two infinitesimal uh, rays like this, so, of, so um, at so the same lambda, or something like this. And zeta, it would be a very similar def definition but with a different coordinate system, instead of having lambda that I use to go to go uh, down the, la the light cone, I, I use tau instead. So this would be yeah, <coughs> proper time. For the observer, the second observer. And I say second observer because I don't want this observer to be confused with the one I uh, wrote the word line of here. Yeah. So tau theta plus delta theta minus x mu tau theta. And of course I have a relation that looks like um, tau or lambda of tau theta and tau of lambda theta. It's just a coordinate transformation from tau or from the system tau theta to lambda theta. So 
now I can relate those two quantities, doing something like um, so. Start here. Okay, you can start from zeta. So another way to write zeta mu is to say this is x mu of lambda of, of what I can write. So I write the zeta in terms. So it's definition, but in terms of the coordinate system lambda theta. So this would look like uh, lambda of tau theta plus lambda theta and theta plus lambda theta minus x mu of lambda tau theta theta. <coughs> Right. This is just expressing the definition of zeta, but in terms of the other coordinate system, the one adapted to the definition of xi. And then I say that this thing is lambda of tau. Oh, yeah. Lambda tau theta plus lambda theta. Um, yes. Theta, can I expand? So when I expand with respect to the first uh, <coughs> entry here, I get so dx mu of anti lambda and this delta theta lambda theta. And then I have the other uh, contribution of this difference coming from the second entry, the one that is actually um, the, uh, the separation vector xi, right? So this is the x mu over theta over theta. Right, so this, you remember, well, by this definition is precisely psi mu. And this is k mu. So whatever this quantity here, I don't really care. I just I know that the difference between zeta and psi is just something which is proportional to k, so the wave four vector. So zeta mu is psi mu plus a given alpha times k mu. And now when I'm doing the screen projection of it. A, which I can write, for example, S, well, S A mu um, theta mu. Well, this is S A mu psi mu plus alpha K mu. And I know that K is orthogonal to S because it's, it is orthogonal to U and to d at the same time by definition. So I get this. So the answer is they are not equal in general. So they are not simultaneous. Those two events separated by xi, they are not uh, simultaneous in general. But in terms of their screen projection, it doesn't matter. They have this, the two light spots have the same distance, whatever their definition, theta of xi. Right. So that was the. Uh, that's the answer to the question. All right, so um, now I would like to, to end this, um, this lecture, second lecture about light beams. I have just a couple of things that I wanted to mention before I slide to the third lecture about the notion of distances in GI and in astronomy and cosmology. So, um, yes, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the area of a beam. So what's the area of a light beam? A small light beam. So you remember that, well, again, when we have our, uh, our light beam, and we have a given light ray, a reference light ray on it with respect to which we can uh, uh, measure, say, the uh, stream difference between the other rays and this 
the reference ray. So a way to write what is the area of the beam by definition would be just the integral of a beam of those d psi. Of those psi, sorry. Why do I test this like this? Psi. Psi A. Right, so this is just by definition what it is. And because I know that by definition those psi A correspond to physical proper distances, so I can't do that. Now, this is not really easy to compute. I don't know how to, to compute this integral in general. But what I can do is to use the quantity that I have introduced at the end of the previous lecture, which is the Jacobi matrix. So you remember the Jacobi matrix is the map between the observed angular separations so at, the, at the observer, where the beam is converging, to those psi A. So I know that. Um, psi A is, so modulo um, the frequency factor, or maybe I'm not, modulo a minus sign that may be, uh, I, for, I think I forgot the minus sign the other time. Uh, there is a subtlety here. Right, so. Yeah, I forgot the minus sign, which is due to the fact that the affine parameter that I have chosen, uh, well, in the in this whole series of lecture, is an affine parameter which is future oriented, and we know that light propagates this way, well, from the source to the observer, so from the past to the from the past to the future. So when I'm going in this direction, like when I'm defining the theta a. Actually, I'm going towards the past, so there is a minus sign which comes from the relation between the psi a dot and this theta b. This is just uh, so I forgot that this happened yesterday because lambda is future oriented. Doesn't really matter, but just for, for the sake of, uh, of completeness. So we have this thing, and again, the important thing with this relation is that this, so the whole lambda uh, dependence, the evolution of this psi a is encoded in d, because this thing is fixed for two, uh, for two light rays that are the same. And the last thing is uh, how we, do we connect that to that? And this you know the answer by definition of the determinant of matrix, right? By definition of the determinant of a matrix, you have that this infinitesimal element d to psi is equal to the determinant of this matrix times the d2 theta. So omega 0 squared, determinant of d times d2 theta. Omega squared because this is a 2 times 2 matrix and the determinant is multilinear. Right. So I can sub substitute this inside this integral. And here I can integrate over the <coughs> angular aperture of the beam. And now if, I'm, if I consider that my beam is infinitesimal, if it's very small compared to the variation, the scale of variation of d, the angular scale of variation of d. So in other words, if I can consider that the, the my, my beam is in really infinitesimal, but I cannot 
but I consider D in this direction is the same as D in a slightly different direction, then I can put the determinant outside from the integral. I get just the integral of D2 theta, which is the angular size, observed size of the image. <coughs> So you see, again, the importance of this quantity, the Jacobi matrix. It is the thing that relates, in particular, the physical area of a light beam to the observed angular aperture, the observed, the observed side. Also, in other words, this connects, if I evaluate that to, at the source, it relates the area of the source to this observed size of the image. Of, of the determinant. When you are doing a multi, uh, uh, well, a multi dimensional change of variable from xy to uv, for example, in the integral you have this determinant or this Jacobian uh, that translates the change of volume between these uh, dx dy and du ah, dv. Okay. You see? Okay. So uh, okay. it's just this thing. Right? So you have a map, a linear map, that goes. Like this, for example. So this would be, for example, yeah, dx and dy. If this is then du dv, so that if yeah, you really <coughs> map this thing to this thing with a linear map. Then, by definition, uh, du dv is the determinant of L dx dy, the ratio of the areas. All right. Okay. Um, yes. Maybe it's actually. Now, oh, yeah, I will talk about other things. Alright, so that's uh, about the area of the beam. Now the other thing I wanted to mention, oh yes, Etherington reciprocity relation. This is crucial. Etherington's theorem. I forgot to <laughs> To have a look at the references, I don't remember in which uh, in which year this has been derived. Um, a long time ago, but uh, so it's it's something very interesting. It's the relation that so a theorem that allows you to change the point of view from a beam that converges to an observer and a beam that converges or that emerges from a source, something like this. So. Uh, just to tell you what it is about and why, why it's, it's important. So if you have an observer and a source, 
depending on the observable that you're considering, it might be more uh, convenient to consider either a light beam that emerges or well, converges to the observer and has a finite size to the source, what we have uh, done so far. For example, when you want to define the angular diameter distance, things like this. But if you want to define a notion of, for example, flux of, uh, of um, photons received by an observer, it's actually more convenient to have the opposite situation in which the beam emerges from the source. So the question is how to relate one uh, picture to the other. All right, so the, um, yes, so um, I will give you the, uh, the, the relation, the referring to this relation, and then I will derive it. It's very simple to derive once we have settled up this whole formalism. So the result is the following. Suppose that this corresponds, so in both cases we can define a, a reference light ray with its uh, affine parameter and everything. Suppose that this corresponds to lambda 1, so starting at lambda 1, and this is lambda 2. So I can define two different Jacobi matrices. Uh, the one that corresponds to my white beam here. So I will define it so, uh, in the case like this. O, I have a Jacobi matrix D, but I will write like this. So lambda, lambda 1. So that's the so D of lambda. And I indicate here that it is done starting from lambda 1, from this position. And I can define another one, the one that is like this. And this I will define it like this. It's just a notation, just to say that this one has started from, from lambda 1, has converged at lambda 1. So that means in particular that this one is 0 when lambda equals lambda 1, and this one is 0 when lambda equals lambda 2. But I know that both, even if they have different, they, they, even if they have different initial conditions, they are both satisfying the Jacobi matrix equation. So the my my matrices are satisfying. Um, this thing, where R is the same anti-quartile matrix because the beam of the rays are propagating through the same space time. Only they have different initial conditions. Right. So the theorem is the following. It tells you that both quantities are directly related. This is the D of lambda 1 starting from lambda 2 is just minus the transpose of D lambda 2 to lambda 1. Just that. So this is the theorem. Let's just prove that. So the trick is to introduce another matrix that I'm going to call C. 
Ikea floor map, which is Z dot transposed lambda starting from lambda 1. So dot means the derivative with respect to lambda. V lambda lambda 2 minus V transposed lambda <coughs> lambda 1 D dot lambda lambda 2. Now I give you uh, leave this as an exercise that is almost trivial. Exercise five. When you calculate c dot and you insert this thing, then you can show that actually c dot is zero. So c is a constant. In particular, c of lambda one equals c of lambda two. And see if you take c of lambda one. This thing vanishes, and you have. Sorry, no. This thing is the identity matrix, because the, the initially the derivative <coughs> of the the Jacobi matrix. So at the point of convergence, it is by definition one. So identity matrix d of lambda one starting from lambda two, and this thing vanishes because d at lambda lambda one lambda one is zero. Then you do the same thing for lambda two. This thing vanishes. This thing is just the transpose of uh, d of well, I can write it here. So we said that this is actually just d of lambda one, lambda two, and this is only this term minus transpose of lambda two, lambda one. So this is the proof of Etherington's reciprocity relation. So you see, this shows you that uh, you can always make all calculations in one picture, the picture in which you have convergence of the beam at of the observer or at the source, and then you can obtain the, the other picture just by a minus sign and a matrix transposition. So that's the way you go from one picture to another. And um, corollary of it, take the determinant of that, you've got the same thing. Because, because the minus sign disappears, because it's two times two matrix, and the, trend, the determinant of the transpose and the, is the equal to the determinant of the matrix itself. And this will be important in the end um, of, uh, of the, the third lecture, so in one hour and a half. Um, to, it will be important to derive what we call the distance duality relation, so between luminosity distance and angular distance. All right, so the last. Can I ask? Yes. Did Ellerton prove this point generally, or did he do a specific case? I don't know. The proof that I used here, I found it in the um, in the uh, the paper by uh, the, the review by Volker Perik. Mm. I don't know if he introduced the trick of this C matrix, or if Etherington had done it. I, I don't know. So this, uh, um, so I don't know if it's uh, fully. I know, I know one or two references to Etherington, um, but I didn't think they were fully general. Okay. Because um, this this proof is fully general in this case. Yeah. My my reference for the well, reciprocity theorem involving distances is Edinburgh's. Ah, okay. So we could have a look. Um, okay, I'll check. It. I'll check that. The interesting to to know. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's always better to to cite the right people. <laughs> okay. It's not completely finished for this lecture. 
I have, well, the third lecture is, is shorter anyway, but um, there are, so the last uh, paragraph is about what we call the optical scalars, the focusing theorem and the Zach scalar equations that you will also find in the literature about gravitational physics. Um, so, uh, optical scalars, yeah, optical scalars. So it's um, kind of an appendix of this uh, whole formalism of the Jacobi matrix. It can be quite useful, in particular it gives um, a good intuition about the effect of uh, Ricci curvature and Weil curvature. A bit uh, that complements quite well what I said yesterday. So the object that you need to define to define the optical scale is to work with them. Uh, is something that I well I don't know if someone else calls it like calls it like this. I like to call it the deformation rate matrix. So uh, define deformation rate matrix. I call it S, and I define it as the derivative of the Jacobi matrix divided by the Jacobi matrix. So it's the rate of change of the Jacobi matrix, and therefore it's the rate of change of the shape of the light beam. Um, exercise can show there is a, actually um, a fully covariant way to, to, to write this matrix. So first, from this and from the definition of the Jacobi matrix, you can always write this almost definition uh, that this is d psi dot a d psi b. That's, you can always write this from from this definition. But the important thing <coughs> that we try to prove is this. The screen projection somehow of this uh, well gradients of the of the wave vector. Alright, so let's make this an exercise. So an interesting property of uh, of this deformation rate matrix is that it is actually symmetric. It's not obvious because D is not symmetric in principle, but S is. And this you can prove it with the, actually with the uh, etheric tunnel theorem. Uh, well, actually from this relation, from the fact that uh, C is, uh, is a constant. Um, from C of lambda, one shows That S transpose in equal place in general. So I can always write, can always decompose, as I did for the, for the optical tidal matrix, I can decompose S into a trace part, scalar part, and a trace free symmetric part. So I can write S equal. Theta plus sigma one, sigma two, sigma two, sigma one. Theta, so the half of the trace of the matrix, as you can see from here, you can write that it is actually something like nabla, nabla mu k mu. This is the expansion rate of the uh, of the light beam.
And a way to see it even more explicitly is to show the following thing. Theta, which is one half of the trace of S, is um, It's one half of the determinant of D dot divided by the determinant of D. So it is A dot of the three. Where I used here the fact that the area of the beam is just proportional to the determinant of the Jacobi matrix with some constant, uh, yeah factors like this, the observed size of the beam, which is something which is constant. So this is what I mean by the expansion rate of the light beam. It tells you yeah, the rate of increase with a fine parameter of the area, the physical area. On the other hand, sigma is called the shear rate. So it's the rate of really distortion uh, of, the, of the beam. What is the evolution equation? Of S, I mean the evolution equations for theta and sigma. So S dot, which is D dot D minus one dot well it's just D dot dot minus 1 minus d dot squared um, oh yeah, it's, uh, d dot d minus 1 d dot d minus 1 right this is R D This is S. So this just tells me that this is R minus S squared. So the evolution equation for S is just the same. So you see, compared to the um, Jacobi matrix equation, it has the advantage of being first order, but it's non linear. Depending on which kind of equation you want to solve, you might choose one or the other. If we write that in terms of those uh, scalars that I defined from the, the elements of, of S, what you get is what we call the Zach scalar equations. The squared equal point zero zero. Uh, wait. I forgot what term that calls. Where sigma is here a complex number 
but it's just made from sigma 1 and sigma 2. Because you remember that psi is 0, so the extra diagonal components of, um, of non trace part of, say, of the optical tidal matrix is a complex number. Right, so just another way of writing the equations for light propagation. They have a, a very, well, they're quite interesting, even if they are somehow more complicated than the Jacob, just the Jacobi matrix equation, which is linear and everything. They have the advantage of, of showing you how shear, well, how shear is sourced by the vial tensor and how expansion of the, the, so the expansion of the light rays, so focusing, is sourced both by Ricci but also by the vial through the shear rate. So that's something interesting is to, to see that when you have a light beam that propagates through, even through vacuum regions, and it's just sheared by some tidal, tidal forces, this does not happen at, um, say, fixed area. It does affect the area of your beam. It does focus your beam indirectly through this shear rate. So this is an important remark, I think. Um, 500, which is the Ricci uh, focusing scalar, uh, directly focuses the beam, but psi zero, so the bypass indirectly does it as well. <coughs> Via sigma. And one consequence is what we call the focusing theorem. And this is the last point of this lecture. Focusing theorem, well, it just consists in replacing here in theta by its expression here in terms of a dot and a. So you replace um, theta by its expression. Note that I can I can also write this thing square root of a dot of the square root of a. And get so this very interesting relation square root of a dot dot equal r minus sigma squared square root of a. Oh, sorry. R psi zero. So, if if you're quite familiar with the consequences of the ratio Dury equation, so when you are do, dealing with uh, time-like geodesic bundles, you know that um, there are not a lot of situations in which you can have a bundle of, of GUDs that's diverging. In other words, in GI, in differential geometry, there are not a lot of situations in which you can have um, a repulsive force between two neighboring geodesics. For time like geodesics, the way you can get it is to violate the strong uh, to violate the um, one of the energy conditions. In particular, if you have um, if you have negative pressure, it does work. But in this case, you need you would need to violate the non-energy condition, which is even more restrictive. So the focusing theorem tells you that this a dot dot is always negative, always because this thing is negative unless 
you violate the null energy condition. Even with um, some, um, some negative pressure, you cannot defocus a light beam. Even with a cosmological constant, you cannot create repulsion between, between light rays. That's the, the message of it. So it's even harder to make repulsion between the light rays than between uh, massive particles. Consequence that, that is always negative unless pi zero zero, which is minus four pi j t mu nu k nu k nu is positive. That is unless the um, null energy condition is violated. So, we usually say that there is no divergent um, gravitational lens. Remember that this is only true in GR. If you have a different uh, equation, uh, equation of motion for the gravitational field, then because this thing is defined from the rigid, of course, if you have something different between rigid and T mu nu, <coughs> the result is different. But in GR, you know, even if you have lambda, which is proportional to lambda g mu nu. So if you put kind of a dark energy component in that, the result is zero. So even lambda does not repel rays. It's known as, the, as a result that lambda does not affect uh, light propagation. There are actually some debates about that. Because this is only true for infinitesimal light beams. And there were some debates until quite recently, and the, the, the answer is not completely clear about if, if you consider uh, finite light, light beams, can you have an effect of lambda on, uh, on focusing? Okay, so it's, it's not clear at all. Okay. Um, all right, so that was the end of lecture two. Whoa, a little bit late. So, well, let's do a break now. I think that's the right, uh, right moment. And then we'll start with uh, uh, a discussion, because I like to start this lecture about distance measures uh, with a discussion. Okay.